Good evening and welcome, folks. Uh, this is a meeting, as you're all well aware of, as to the closing of the pool and our next steps for that. I appreciate the turnout tonight. Uh, the decision wasn't uh, an easy one to make, and you will see by the information that you're going to gather tonight. We have Carol and Sonia in the front. We'll be taking notes on everything that everybody says. If there's questions that need to be answered later, we will get to that. Uh, I'd like to welcome my fellow councillors, Duncan Wong, uh, Les Ellsworth, Judy Collada, and Deputy Mayor Valentino and Anthony McGinnis, our city manager. He will be leading us through the presentation tonight. So once we go through the presentation, please feel free to use the microphones and ask your questions. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm gonna do a brief uh, presentation just to bring you through how we got to where we're at right now. Um, for most people who know the North Pucks Pool, it was built in 1976. It was part of a bid for the Canada Games. Um, it's a two-level building with a basement. And the only major upgrades that we found in the records are were done in about 1997. It was mostly to the building envelope. So it was the out external structure. There was really no work that was done on the internal structure of the building. Um, in 19, or 2017, the building experienced a fire, which was primarily electrical. Um, just so I can give you an overview of what we're going to go through, we're going to start off with what the failures were and the different major components that all added up to cause the situation that we're in. Uh, we're going to review very quickly some of the engineering assessments. We've had about four different ones done by different companies. Um, the safety implications, the financial implications, and uh, what we see as the path forward. So um, what had happened is with, with the new council, we have a fairly new administration. Um, we'd started hearing things and this has been around town for a while, people had concerns with the pool. The staff were bringing concerns forward, people in the community are bringing concerns forward, what's going on at the pool, how come things are down all the time, what's going on. Um, we'd set up a meeting with some of our staff at the pool in uh, late January, actually, and asked them, you know, uh, we had some repairs that were underway, we were trying to catch up on some of the small mechanical things that we were doing, and they said, you know, there's bigger problems here that you really have to look at. There's things that you have to consider and look at it from top to bottom. So um, one of the things that I've done since I've taken over as a city manager is I'm trying to centralize the way our engineering is done in the city. In the past, different units did their own kind of work. I'm looking to centralize this to make it more efficient. So I tasked our engineering group to work with the recreation department as well as the pool to go through the building top to bottom, mechanically and electrically, let us know what the issues are, and then we could bring that forward to council as part of this year's budget process so that we could get the money on the table to get this, the facility running a little more reliably. Um, so I'm just gonna go through what our engineering team found, and some of this is what they found themselves, and a lot of it is corroborated by the engineering reports that we have. Um, the unit that you see here, this thing is called a dryotron, or a dectron. Think of it as a massive dehumidifier that keeps the building dry. So it's in the basement of the pool, and its, it's single job is to dry the air out return it back to the pool and circulate all the air in the system. Basically, 90% of this system has failed, which is why a lot of people that have been in the building the last few years have noticed when you go in, it's extremely humid, there's water and condensation all over the place, and those sorts of issues that we're seeing. Um, a number of other things that started to come out of this too is uh, this system is supposed to be integrated into a computer system that controls the way that the air moves through the building. So if it notices that one area is too humid, or if it's a certain temperature, it adjusts the airflow through all the louvers and the, the dampers throughout the building to control the total uh, humidity and the, the temperatures and things that are moving around. Ever since the fire, none of this has been quite working. And as we started to look through the engineering reports with the new team, uh, some of the things are telling us that these components have been failing for about 10 years, if not more. Um, our engineering estimates to replace this unit on its own are about $300,000. Um, the recommendations are to move it outside of the building to increase its efficiency. That would require extra ducting work, which would possibly be another $300,000. So we're talking just over half a million dollars there. Um, this is another electrical panel. Uh, you'll notice it's in very poor condition. It's original to the building. This electrical panel controlled all the heat on the non-pool side. This is original to the building. Um, ever since the fire that happened in 2017, it has not worked. 
from this panel, the heat on the um, non-pool side was controlled, as well as a lot of the electronics that controlled the way that the air moved around the building. Um, our estimates from some of our local electricians and the uh, control specialist out of Winnipeg is roughly $700,000 to get a new panel in. Hydro would not allow us to energize this system because um, it was so obsolete, there were so many issues, they condemned it. So this has happened for about a year now. It hadn't showed up at budget last year, so uh, the council was not aware of it last year, but we're aware of it now, and um, there's another, another talk. Um, this one here is pretty scary. Um, this literally happened as we were in the building. So we asked for the engineering review. They did about a week of work. They called us in and had a management team walking through. And as we were walking through the building, water literally started pouring on top of the transformer, the main transformer in the basement. We were told that this had happened in the past and that the joists on the, uh, the ceiling had been sealed to prevent this. But it literally started happening. You could see um, up in the top, Someone in the past had put sheet metal there. There was a bucket to catch the water. Um, very major safety concern. So, um, and this literally happened as we were walking through the building. So we immediately called uh, Manitoba Hydro when we saw that. And I believe this is the day before or the day that we closed the facility. Louvers and dampers. Uh, these are basically inside your ducts. Their purpose is to open and close, redirect air, uh, tr control how air is traveling. You can see that uh, the louvers are completely covered with ice. Because everything had failed about 10 years ago, we discovered, we talking to the staff, that because the staff were still trying to control the air through the system, they were crawling into the ducts and manually changing them, trying to keep everything running for the system, because they're trying to keep the pool up and running. So um, all the sensors and all the automation that would have been in the system, not only was the computer gone, but a lot of the automation, the sensors in there were gone. The louvers themselves, in some cases, were completely, these ones are fine, but the rods are missing. In some cases, the entire louvers were rusted away, and there was nothing there. Um, our estimates on this one to do some more repairs and get that up and running, roughly half a million dollars. And as a result of this, there's no control of humidity in the building. There's no control of the air and temperature. So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the knockoff effects that you start to see is what people notice this year. Because all these things kind of accumulated and showed up this not showed up this year, you add them up this year, you start to see uh, this new phenomenon that happened at the front door as you're coming in. We still haven't figured out how the air, the the warm, uh, wet air was hitting this, but it was escaping the building through some sort of an opening, and we're having an accumulation of ice. This is the same with our, I guess you'd call the birthday party room or the little conference room that's in the upstairs. Um, we redid it this summer as one of our efforts to uh, improve the building. And within, uh, once the winter hit, within weeks, we had water going into the new drywall, complete condensation everywhere because we had no ability to control the humidity in the building. Um, this one I think a lot of people are very aware of, the ongoing hole in the ceiling in the women's washroom. The reason for the hole in the ceiling is because there is such little humidity control and uh, the, the, the you could call it the humid warm air hitting the cold air on the envelope of the building there's always condensation happening and the ceiling no matter what we did to it was always going to fall in because it, the uh, the root cause was not being addressed it doesn't matter how many times we change this it's simply going to saturate and fall back in again um, other issues that go with this though are now we have a ceiling that's wet we've got electrical because of that we have to disconnect the electrical and then on top of that now we're hearing from health that our lighting is too low so those are, the, like, just to show that there's always a knock-on effect because of the lack of control of the humidity. Uh, we started to see this happening again, uh, or this year, in the men's change room. Um, specifically over here, we started to see it looked like it was raining. Um, at first, we thought it was a, a condensation on the inside, and then what it turned out to be was that there was an accumulation of water and ice above this. Uh, this is a, a plywood with plaster and tile and we were very afraid that this was going to fall in unexpectedly onto someone's head while they're in the shower area. Uh, as well as part of our engineering review, we, we pulled all the original drawings to the building to try to understand how is the air supposed to be moving, what was the original design to the building. Um, one of the things that was determined was there's a failure of the return air system, which is why the lobby is always humid. The lobby should actually be dry and controlled and separate from the rest of the building, but we were finding that it's always humid in there, 
air is a bit stagnant, very strong chlorine smell. Um, our engineers have determined, at least internally, that to hook this in properly to assure that there's proper ventilation would probably be about $200,000 to uh, add new ductwork. So just to give you a quick summary, um, the dehumidifier doesn't work. The ceilings in the men's and women's, we were afraid they were uh, going to fall in. Condensation throughout the building, the return air not working in the building, the louvers and dampeners, which control the airflow and direction, weren't working. And uh, we also determined that the ducts had not been cleaned. And our, uh, uh, we're talking 10-inch ducts uh, with maybe only a few centimeters left for air to pass by. So we're, we're, our belief is that they've never been cleaned since the building had been built. Um, none of the sensors, as I said, have been working. And on top of that, because of the strong amount of humidity, we suspect there should be mold somewhere in the building. Uh, we've seen indications there might be, but we don't have proof of what that extent of mold could be. So that's something that we still have to look into. Um, and then, of course, you don't mix electricity and water. And with all that moisture and the water issues, uh, we had strong concerns about that. Uh, this is an aside. This is also a safety concern, is our water slide. I believe our water slide, I, I remember growing up in this pool, I think it was put in, in the, around the 90s, maybe the early 1990s. Um, over the years, because of the high humidity and its exposure to chlorine, we're now seeing that the main support structures are starting to rust. So um, it's probably just reaching its end of life. It's a, not a coincidence, but it's happening around the same time that these other failures are occurring. Um, but it will require a major upgrade, and we're, we're worried about the safety of continuing to use the water slide. Um, a few of the other things that we found, the supports that are up at the top are rusted. They've been painted over, but there's still rust underneath and could fail. And our engineers noticed over here that someone in the past, uh, there might have been rust in these, or as they were built, they welded in pieces. So it's not an actual uh, complete member. It's a member with pieces that are welded in, which means it doesn't have the strength it's supposed to have to bear the weight of the structure. And uh, our internal estimates on that one and uh, with some of our external engineers, maybe $150,000 on that one. This one previous, we figure 100, add them up, maybe 100. 150, 200, yeah. So a few of the other issues, and these are more uh, housekeeping maintenance, but they're still there as well to, to go on top of this. Uh, we've got plumbing that's failing. That's not just us, it's also the engineering reports. I've noted that uh, because of the high chlorine humidity, um, that a lot of the plumbing throughout the basement and around the pool uh, needs to be replaced. Um, we've had the lifeguards tell us that the, the roof is leaking in the pool deck. A few of them would joke that when it was raining outside, they knew because it started to rain inside. Um, humidity damage, uh, we're also worried about the beautiful uh, wood ceiling in the pool deck, that all those years of humidity, as well as the water coming through the roof, have uh, damaged that structure. Uh, like I talked about, um, some people have asked us, why did we do upgrades to the women's washroom? Um, one of the reasons was our uh, new pool manager identified that water was actually leaking through the floor of the women's washroom down into the basement where the electrical was. So that was one of the major reasons that we had to upgrade that flooring this fall. Um, we've also noticed that the back escape stairwell is in need of replacement. And our chlorine sensors, though they're still, um, they're proper for when it was designed, they wouldn't be up to code to what's acceptable nowadays. And um, also our bulkhead, that's the separator in between the, the shallow side and the deep side, is kind of at its end of life. It needs a replacement. I believe there was discussions before the Winter Games of replacing that but there wasn't time to have something custom manufactured. Um, one of the engineering reports that was done was done in 2014. This was a very high level report, and what I mean by that was cursory. It was just to kind of give a, an overview. What kind of issues are we facing here? Um, it was done by the LBE group. Uh, it was a high level, like I said, and it noted that a number of the components that are in the basement that you never see had failed about 10 years ago. Um, they also noted that if the failures weren't dealt with, that they would compound, that there'd be more building to the, or more damage to the building inside. Um, and it also noted that the entire electrical system was pretty much obsolete. You could not get the parts for it anymore. And uh, there was corrosion and all kinds of issues in the basement. And they warned that it could potentially at some point uh, cause a threat to safety. Um, their estimates at a very, very high level, doing a walkthrough kind of assessment, was just over half a million dollars for repairs. Uh, because of that, the city uh, engaged another engineering company to do a very a much more in-depth assessment. Um, it was by the Alliance Engineering Services. And keep in mind, these two assessments are only um, electrical and mechanical. 
It's not looking at anything cosmetic. It's not looking at anything structural around the building. They're looking at the electricity. They're looking at the ventilation systems and anything that sort of moves uh, on under power. Um, they also noted that most of the electrical needs replacement and that most of the internal systems had failed. They said that to fix this, you would have to close the pool. Um, and their estimates were about $3.4 million, um, plus or minus 25%. So when you add that up in 2015 dollars, that's $2.6 million to $4.3 million. Um, talking about other engineering assessments, since then the city has engaged a company called Proforma Engineering out of Winnipeg. It's started by Doug Crocus, who originally grew up in Thompson. Uh, they've been providing engineering supports to the city on the different types of repairs that could be done over the years. Um, they've also engaged AMP Services, which is a local electrical company, also out of Winnipeg and works with Valet, to kind of look at some of the electrical repairs that had to be done in the building. Um, the City of Thompson, our own internal engineering department, we have an engineer in the development services, as well as our manager of assets and infrastructure. So all these groups have been working together, um, and our internal group has been working with our, our service providers to come up with these, uh, this assessment. So the safety implications. Um, the risk of the falling ceilings in the change rooms, that was a huge one. Uh, when we were talking about structural, we weren't saying that the outside of the building was gonna fall in, but we were worried about things on the inside falling off the building. Um, the risk to the electrical systems in the, in the change rooms, obviously, people are showering, people are in there, there's wet surfaces, and those electrical systems that are being exposed to humidity and the potential of them failing or falling and, and getting into water. Um, the electrical, uh, the obsolete electrical components in the basement and as well as the associated risk of fire. Most of those have been taken offline, but like I said, we suddenly had water coming in right over top of the main transformer. The inability, because we are unable to control the air systems in the building, we're not able to open and close them. Like um, if they're on sensors in a computer and there's ever a fire in there, those systems would automatically shut to prevent the spread of fire. Because we have no control except manually, if there were to be a fire, there'd be no way for us to control the spread of the fire throughout the facility. Uh, as I said, the water infrastructure, the, the risk of the failure of our water slide, and then also us having employees entering basically confined spaces every day, multiple times a day, trying to move these louvers to keep the air moving properly. Um, our potential for mold, we have no idea. That's something that we're hiring a consultant now to look through the building, determine the extent of if there is any mold and at what extent and the lack of sufficient lighting, which is an order from the province. What have we done since? You can see that we've built a wooden structure. The entire pool has been uh, emptied of water and we've put it basically into care and maintenance. So we're running the system right now just to keep sufficient heat um, to keep the building from any pipes from breaking until that we can put it into, uh, decide what the next phase is for this building. Um, we're working with our user groups as much as we can and our staff are working for providing refunds for those users who've already paid. Uh, the province, after the fact, decided to give us some stop work orders, uh, consisting of uh, doing an asbestos inventory. Um, that's because the building was built in the mid 70s. They want to ensure that if we do any future work, renovations or rebuilds on the building, or if we were to tear it down, whatever the future of the building is, we have to have an asbestos inventory of the building, as well as the mold assessment. So the cost to repair. Um, these numbers that we're throwing out here are based on, we're trying to amalgamate all the different engineering reports that we have, as well as our own internal engineering estimates. So we'll say they're all plus or minus 25%, just for that, um, what we call kind of a class C estimate, class D estimate. Um, our electrical, plumbing, and other mechanical, like that report said, about 3.4, 3.5 million. Um, the additional work to the Dectron, 300,000. The lobby return air, 200,000. Louvers, dampers, sensors, roughly half a million. Water slide repairs, quarter of a million or less. And the condemned electrical panel upgrades and integration. So we're looking roughly about $5.2 million, plus or minus, with the range being 3.9 to 6.5 million. That does not include anything on the pool deck that you see. That is not anything to do, this is all the stuff in the guts of the building that you do not see. Um, it also does not un factor in unknown cost as such as mold or asbestos or anything that would have to go with codes if we were to retrofit that building to make uh, accessibility codes, lighting, whatever they are for the, the more modern building codes. So the big question is why wasn't money invested in the past? Um, in 2009, 
the city refused, uh, the city received notice from the province that we were required to build a, a wastewater treatment plant in the estimated range that would be about 30 million some dollars. Where right now our, our wastewater treatment plant that's being built is a 36 million dollar facility to meet the standards set up by the federal government in the province. Um, at that time, the city council of the day prepared a five year plan to get itself ready for the uh, wastewater treatment plant that was coming down. So in order to access the 60% funding, because um, in a lot of these projects, if you get um, federal provincial funding, the city only has to pay a portion, the federal government, the provincial government will pay the rest. So rather than have the city pay the full $30 million, uh, they had realized that they had to work with the province, and that's why water meters were put in place. This is why the water utility was created. The only way to access the money to build the wastewater treatment facility was to develop a water utility. Uh, because of that, the grant was subsequently approved, which reduced the city's amount that they had to spend down to 33 and a, th a third percent. Um, so at that time, because we knew we were going to have to book $12 million of our portion towards this project, the city council at the time uh, put a hold on issuing any debentures. That basically means no more loans. We can't take any more loans until we can save up this, the space for loans to pay for our portion of the wastewater treatment. And ever since then, all of the councils since every year have maintained that, trying to develop the uh, borrowing capacity to pay for our wa uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, they did take a debenture of uh, $340,000 in 2016 to try to address some of the smaller issues to start to pick away at some of the mechanical stuff. But as you've seen the numbers, um, that is just a, a scratch at the surface, but they were trying to work with what was available at the time realizing that they still had to book the money in the future for the wastewater treatment plant. Um, the debenture room that we've had in the past few years has grown. Um, that's a combination of because our city's assessments have gone up, and as well as every year the city has paid down $1 million of debt from the past. And that debt would be things like the construction of the RCMP buildings roughly 25 years ago. We're still paying that off. I believe that's paid off this year. The TRCC building, all those other sorts of facilities that we had to borrow for in the past have been slowly paid off a million dollars a year. So as you can see, um, if you were to go back to 2012, the debenture that we're allowed under the Municipal Act, which is based on how much our revenues are, how much our, this is basically what our borrowing power was in 2012. At the time, we had borrowed 20 and a half million, leaving nine and a half million for debenture room. Knowing that they were gonna have to pay $12 million they realized they were $3 million in the hole, which is why they weren't gonna borrow any money for the pool. And as you can see, going year to year, our debenture room has increased, the amounts of debentures that we've paid off every year, and uh, our debenture room available has increased. Uh, the amount for our portion is still at 12 million, but as you can see, we started to go cash positive around 24, 14, and we're just creeping up to where we can pay for our wastewater treatment plant through debentures. Uh, to put it in perspective, what does this mean in terms of taxes? Each million dollars that is taken out in debenture creates about a $100,000 payment, which uh, plus or minus 25%, depending on what the interest rates are every year. That works out to about a 1% tax increase. So each uh, million dollars is a 1% tax increase. $8 million is an 8% tax increase. That's over the life of this facility as well. So that if the facility's life is 25 years, that's taxes going up by 8% over 25 years. So what's the path forward? Um, the internal discussions that we've had in council are um, two options. The first one is renovate and rebuild. The second one is build new. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. So um, renovate and rebuild. One of the major limitations is a limit to the access to grants. There's fewer grants out there to rebuild than there are to build new. It's just kind of an unfortunate reality. Most people like to play, put money towards things that are new and fancy rather than rebuilding what you already have. Um, this building will also re require a full engineering review top to bottom, not just the mechanical electrical, to figure out what are all the other issues in the building that we might not be seeing. Um, we'll also have to renovate and bring it up to modern codes to determine what the uh, extent of asbestos behind the walls and those other things could be. We'd also have to do upgrades for accessibility reasons to make the pool more accessible um, and to integrate possibly new features or expand the facility. So, so these are some of the curse are very preliminary discussions that have been had at the council level. 
build new, um, access to more grants. Uh, the problem is we have to identify a location. Some people have mentioned the TRCC. We're very limited on land there at the moment, but it could be a possibility. Engineers would have to tell us, and architects, if it's possible. Um, having a group of uh, people from the community to tell us what features we need, what things should we be incorporating, uh, integrating energy efficiency. That's one of the ba major prerequisites for grants nowadays, especially up in the north, is how is it carbon neutral, how is it energy efficient. Um, developing independent aquatic areas. What I mean by this is one of the weird things about our pool is that the water would come in on one end, it would go out on the other end, the bulkhead had holes in the middle. So one thing that would happen is if there were kids in the, the, the small side and there was a pool fouling, we have to close the entire pool because the water is continuous. It's shared water. So a new facility, obviously, you'd want to have uh, separate, uh, separate water, basically, for the different user groups so that if there's an accident in one of them, you don't have to close the pool. And then integrating in any other, uh, other ideas that the community might have. So what are the steps that are underway? So since we've done this in the last, uh, I guess, month, less than a month, uh, the ad hoc pool committee has been formed. It's being chaired by Councillor Valentino. Um, the city is about to launch an asset management program. What's an asset management program? It's basically a system set up so that things like this can't happen again in the future. It's an assessment of every single facility that we have, top to bottom. What are all the things that are in it? What are their conditions? And then it develops a risk matrix for council so that they know this is where we have to spend our money every year. It gives them a way to spend their money responsibly and wisely so that uh, systems or, or buildings like this don't get into the state that they get in. Um, that way, if people get onto council, and future councils, whatever they may be, uh, our plan is to enact it as a bylaw, so it makes it harder to change, that um, money's being spent where it needs to be spent, not necessarily on projects that are more the flavor of the day. Um, we've already started allocating our funds in 2019 towards the engineering study, which will give two options. One is the rebuild, or one is the build new. Um, and we've already started putting in for grants. Um, we've been in contact with the provincial government and the federal government, and what we're also doing is following up on a program that has been signed between Canada and Manitoba called the uh, Canada Infrastructure Program, Investing in Canada. Um, that is a big, I believe, about $10 million that has been dedicated to the province of Manitoba over 10 years with uh, four main areas, uh, one of them public transport, the next being green infrastructure, rural and northern, which would apply to this um, project, as well as community culture and recreation. So there's two of these streams out of the four that would apply to this building, whether it's a rebuild or um, a new build. And from my presentation, that's all I have. If there's any questions or if council wants to make any mention of anything, um, we have two microphones here. I think we'll limit it to one or two questions at a time so that if there's other people that want to come up or if there's not many questions, people can take their time. But the mics are open. to the mic let's state your name uh, please and I'd just like to welcome Jeff Fountain who has come in since we started and I'd like to mention Earl Colburn is in Winnipeg just uh, doing some doctor appointments and Brian Lundmark is home ill tonight. Hi my name is Andre Pru. Um, we have a lot of water obviously around Thompson and a lot of kids. Is there a plan in place to uh, I guess train kids or have the swimming lessons still at outdoor pools or the lake or anything like that for safety reasons? So um, yes, uh, right now there's plans in place for uh, water awareness training, which isn't exactly swimming lessons, but it's awareness training that'll happen throughout the year, so just so that uh, kids are being uh, taught about water safety. On top of that, um, we're in discussions with local pool owners to see if one of the pools can be purposed, uh, basically set aside for use for uh, kids to still be trained by our lifeguards who are still on staff. Um, and as well as that, there is talk about using one of the wading pools during the summer for water awareness as well as uh, it have to be younger ages, of course, because of the depth of the pool, but also uh, water safety and swimming lessons. Thank you. Uh, just one more question. Um, I guess with, I know it's early, but do you have like a ballpark timeline and when you would see construction happening on either a retro or, or a new building? That one's a little harder to nail down. Um, 
basically to get our engineering study done, uh, whether it's a rebuild or new build with, uh, to get a shovel ready project, we estimate it'd probably be about nine months uh, optimistically. Um, after that, it also depends on what money we can get in place for a new build. Uh, we're hoping to time our shovel ready, whatever it is, for federal and provincial election calls. Uh, just in anticipation that grants and money might become available at those times. Okay, thanks. Hi, Danielle Adams. With all of the safety issues you were you guys were raising with the pool, how on earth did it pass inspections for it to be remained open? Um, in terms of our internal, this is something that we did ourselves, so uh, that was where at least uh, the new council and staff were trying to be proactive. In terms of provincial inspections and others, I can't answer that. I don't know. Is that an I could just tell you what we walked into. This is what we saw, and we made a decisive decision Can to you, shut it immediately. Is somebody asking how it was able to pass inspection? We are beginning those discussions with our counterparts, yes, okay. uh, because w we, we have some of the same questions. Yeah, I'd also mention that a uh, number of our provincial offices aren't quite, um, we don't have staff in them at the moment, so there is no safety officer in Thompson at the moment, nor is there a public health officer at the moment, which we've highlighted to the province. Um, Rob Ricketts, just curious on how you plan on maintaining the current lifeguards certifications without them having the water bodies that they're gonna need to recertify to, to use. I know my son's is up next year. If you guys don't have a pool by this time next year, his certification's gonna be gone. I don't know about the other lifeguards. Like, is there a plan for that? That's, um, that's something that we're currently working on. We don't, I, I don't have an answer for you right, right now. Our, uh, because this is less than a month, our main focus was to get the facility safe, to find meaningful work for the employees that were engaged at the pool, and then work on a longer term plan. So unfortunately, I don't have that answer for you, but we are working on it through our, our pool manager to see what can be offered. Uh, Steve Ashton, uh, I must admit, I was pretty shocked, like I think a lot of people uh, probably here tonight in the community when the pool was closed, but I'm doubly shocked when I've seen the presentation. Um, and I don't envy, uh, what uh, you're all dealing with, uh, you know, in terms of mayor and council and, uh, and in terms of those who are dealing with the technical issues. Um, I think the obvious question we're all asking, you know, maybe it's a rhetorical question, is how, how it got to this point. And, you know, as much as there have been challenges the last few years, this is a 40 year old facility. Um, a lot of what we're looking at uh, with proper asset management should have been dealt with and, and haven't been responsible for government buildings across the province for a number of years. I don't think I've ever seen a presentation that was um, more shocking than that. And I echo, I think, Danielle's question about how safe an environment it was the last number of years for everybody that was in there. So I don't question for a moment, having seen the presentation, uh, why that decision was made. I guess the question obviously is uh, where we go from here and one of the obvious questions, I know you've costed out the uh, uh, repair side of the equation is uh, building a new facility and I don't think we should be naive about building a new facility. Uh, I came to this community with my mom and dad in 1967. There was talk about a pool in 1967. We actually had a referendum, it got voted down. It was 12 years before it was built. Um, it's, you know, how many years were we discussing the TRCC? Um, and I do wanna note, by the way, that uh, it's unfortunate that this wasn't identified at the time of the TRCC discussions, which is only a few years ago, because I do believe uh, at that time, uh, when we were building uh, the new uh, rec facilities we did, this would have been a prime candidate. So, and that gets back to the previous question. Um, but in addition to the question, there's one thing I really want to raise as well, because I've heard a few people in the community going, well, you know, I don't swim, uh, it doesn't affect me. Now, my kids both went through TNT. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the pool. Um, I think we know the competitive side of it. Um, uh, you know, my mom went there every day, right? She, she was there at six, seven o'clock in the morning with late Bob Mayer, Stella Walker. Uh, there, how many people in this community have learned to swim there? And, and, and just for the record, we've got the highest drowning rate outside of coastal regions in northern Manitoba. I always felt if there's a problem with the pool, is that more kids didn't go there. How about the people who've taken Red Cross training there? And let alone any of the other activities, scuba diving and all the rest of it. 
And the reason I'm raising this is because, um, you know, I think the key decision we have to make for a community is that we're just going to turn our back on that. And this is a tough time for the community. Um, I couldn't think of a worse thing to do for us as a community right now than to say we're not committed to replacing the pool. I'm not questioning anybody in, 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 in terms of mayor and council. I think there's been some real indication that this is a priority. I may be saying this to the community as a whole. If you want to signal, signal that Thompson's somehow in decline, you just don't replace the pool. If you want to signal that we're a dynamic community and we care about all of our citizens, we rebuild it. So maybe the bigger question outside of the, uh, the more technical ones uh, I want to ask is, are we prepared as a community, are you as, as mayor and council prepared to make this our top priority? Because quite frankly, I know we have many priorities in this community, but losing the pool would be a major blow, not just to Thompson, but many surrounding uh, communities as well. Folks, Les Ellsworth, the newly elected city councillor. And let me tell you something, I was just as shocked as probably anyone here tonight when I took a tour of the pool about two months ago, starting from the bottom, going to the top. Now, for those that have known me for many years, I've spent most of my career in safety. And Danielle asked a question about inspections. Well, I haven't been asking those questions as well. Uh, there was one thing to do the, the inspection or the tour, I should say, of the, the pool and, and the devastation that I, as an instructor in safety, as someone very familiar with the law, it, uh, it was heartbreaking. And I remember going home that evening telling my son, who, who works at Valet, if they don't close that pool, someone will be seriously injured or hurt. When we got the report the night in question um, that the decision was made to close the pool, I will stand up here and I'll tell you, I didn't hesitate whatsoever closing the pool, knowing what I knew with a number of grandchildren that attends that pool, was attending, a daughter that went through, as Steve mentioned, competitive in TNT years ago. Um, in good conscience, we had no choice to close this pool. But the question that Steve asked, and I get 11%, just so you know, to vote on council. The question that Steve asked in regards to while we build a pool, while we rebuild, well, I'll tell you for me personally, and I'll say it publicly, I would not be in favor of, re of refurbishing or rebuilding that pool with what we know. I just wouldn't do that. But I am certainly in favor of building the pool because we need a pool in Thompson. And I've been an advocate for, from day one I got on council saying that we need to build our city. We just came straight down. We're going to go back up. And I believe with partnerships, Thompson will be better than ever. But we need, we've come with, to you with the problems. What we need now is you to help us with the solution. And we need to listen to the taxpayers of Thompson, those that use it, the different uh, groups that use it, because you know more about it than me. I don't swim, but I'm certainly prepared to listen to your ideas and fight on your behalf. Thank you. So I feel that I am doing a victim impact statement right now because I don't think you realize what going to the pool is going to mean to people. I'm overweight. I have a bad heart. I have a defibrillator. I have a knee replacement that never worked. The only thing that's saving my life is going to the pool. That's all I can do. When you're at the pool, you feel not connected to your earthly body anymore. You're free, you're free to move, you're free to just m move, which is something that's hard for me. And I know people, you know, people overweight will just go to the gym. It's not that easy. You don't understand if you're, if you're not big, you don't understand. The pool was everything. And I've been gone for two years. And I went swimming, gone, I was in Regina, I swam at the Y every day. They took good care of that pool such good care because they knew what it meant to everybody in the community to go swimming and even in a little town of Valcarin where I lived in Ontario it wasn't the best pool but it was a pool and it breaks my heart that the city council I know it's not I just don't understand 
how you said 10 th years in your speech or your presentation, 10 years, 10 years I heard. 10 years, oh my gosh, we're lucky someone wasn't killed. Like how does this happen? That's what I wanna know. I, I understand your whole presentation of how the pool's closed, I totally agree with you. I was sitting there, I was the person sitting there under that light when that water started dripping on my head. And I just, it was like, oh, just what the? You know, like where was the money for the pool 10 years ago? Why wasn't it every year something for the pool? So that's what I wanna know. I, I, I get it why, I wanna know how it happened. I want paperwork that shows every year since the pool was open, how much money went to the pool? Why wasn't it ever more money? We need more money. It's important, you don't realize how important it is to someone like me. And I'm sure it's important to a lot of other people, a small group of us, Bob Mayer, I was at the pool a week watching that man walk out with skin and bones, but the love of the swimming at that pool on his face was there. And he was gone a week later, but he was at that pool. It's so important to us. Please, please build a pool for the future of Tonks. First, just want to say thank you very much for hosting kind of a public forum for people to ask questions and speak their piece. I think that's important. Um, my name is Heather. Um, I work at the primary care clinic as a primary care provider, so I'm just here to voice concerns from the healthcare perspective. Um, so it's our job to bolster health promotion and disease prevention in our community, and a swimming pool is one of the most effective tools that we can use. It's one of the most efficient cardiovascular exercises that works our heart, our lungs, our muscles, improves our range of motion, and uh, it helps reduce uh, chronic diseases such as high blood pressure and diabetes, which are hugely prevalent in this community. Um, people with chronic pain or who are physically deconditioned are usually recommended to start exercising in a pool because it reduces joint stress while providing resisted movement that develops strength, reduces their pain, and promotes weight loss. People with fibromyalgia and Parkinson's are encouraged to swim in a pool because the warm water helps to soothe their muscle, enhances motor control, and provides enough resistance for exercise. And swimming has been shown to uh, benefit people with cancer-related fatigue. Um, and finally, as we've already heard, um, Swimming lessons are hugely important in reducing the risk of drowning, which is actually the number one cause of death in children ages one to four. And lastly, the mental health benefits of regular exercise and the sauna uh, can't be understated for a subarctic community like ours. Uh, so in considering the significant health challenges that our community faces, I hope you'll consider these words um, with respect to the expediency of the pool that will be built and maintaining it. Hi, Desiree Angus, I'm a lifeguard, was a lifeguard and will be again. I have no doubt that city council is going to get us a pool might be rebuilt, we might build a new one, but it's going to happen. I've been in aquatics for 18 years. I moved here when I was two, uh, so I've been swimming at the Norplex pool for 32 years. I have herniated discs, I have stenosis of the spine. I understand that people need to swim, and swimming is my life. What the guards would like everybody to know and I'm speaking on behalf of people who aren't here, but I have permission, is that we are going to do everything we can to engage the community in water safety programs. We are going to use every facility that we have access to to make sure that we're still doing lessons. We're still running our aerobic programs. We are still bringing public awareness to water safety. Um, our supervisor, Sonia, uh, we wanna thank you for finally listening to us. I started working at the pool in 2001, 
And I know that in 2005, that's when we started to notice humidity problems. Now, I was a part-time lifeguard. I don't know what went on at the management level, but it has been going on for a long time, and I know that you, as a council and city manager and our new supervisor, were not there. And we just want to thank you for finally listening to us because the building was unsafe. We were being put in a situation where we could get hurt, and we wouldn't be able to care for you or your children in that facility because the roof could potentially drop on our heads. So I just want to thank council, the mayor, city manager, and Sonia for listening to us. Thank you. My name is Chu Chong. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm sure that everybody down here are very concerned about our swimming pool. Now, when I first came to Thompson in 1975, when 1976 they start building a swimming pool, I was so happy to see such a beautiful infrastructure that every time I pass by, I just so admire the swimming pool. And uh, when, when I was young, I used to learn how to swim in the river. And I was so happy that people here have such opportunity that to learn how to swim, especially my kids. When they are young, they enroll in the goldfish, they learn how to swim, that save their life in case something happened. So coming to this stage here, just maybe a year ago, I asked for the engine report, but I was refused, but I keep asking until I, I put in a PBA to get the engine report. So on the engine report, they did not mention anything about the structural integrity, but only the mechanical, electrical, and what I understand here tonight, uh, the majority of the damage because of the ventilation system and uh, the ignore and malfunction for over 10 years. So because lack of maintenance or lack of understanding about how the thing work, or maybe can't get the part to fix it. So I'm a mechanical in mechanic in, in, uh, in, in my trade, and I understand about how mechanical, the palm, the electrical, and stuff like that, I do a lot of the damper, lure, and sensor, all these things. So I add up all the information down there on your, on your screen down there, and it come up to about $1.95 million, if I'm not mistaken. But the final thing down there you show, which is about what, two, almost three to six million dollars in order to upgrade, to repair the pool. But for the time being, what should we do? Are we gonna fix the pool so that people can use it? Or are, are we gonna waiting for the money to come so we can build a new pool? To build a new pool, I'm sure it take a long time, not just one year or a few months or so. It take years, maybe two, three, and they involve a lot of money to do that. So I hope we can come up with a solution tonight or from the council or from the city administration. Thank you. Nikki Ashton, I wanna thank you for doing this uh, meeting and, and uh, providing such an in-depth presentation. I can't imagine that uh, this is easy. Uh, the images were shocking, uh, but also heartbreaking. As somebody who grew up in uh, learning how to swim in that pool, uh, went through TNT, uh, um, trained as a, to be a lifeguard, uh, and somebody who hoped that I could send my kids there right away, uh, the image particularly of the pool being empty was truly heartbreaking. I want to also say a big thank you to those that came up and talked about uh, uh, what an impact it has on their own health. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think these stories with all of their emotions show how important it is for us to move as a community as soon as possible in finding a solution and, uh, uh, and, and looking at, at uh, uh, building the best possible uh, pool for our community. Uh, I want to say that uh, as, uh, you know, as a proud Thompsonite, you know, this is my home. Uh, you know, I, I uh, um, 
I feel strongly about this, but also as Member of Parliament. Uh, this is about uh, signaling that Thompson is uh, is here to stay, is a community of the future, that, uh, you know, that we are the hub of the North. That means we need to have this kind of infrastructure. Uh, so I do want to commit today uh, to you as, as Council, obviously uh, to our community, that as Member of Parliament, uh, I will do anything that I can to uh, go to bat uh, uh, for uh, this, uh, this pool, for uh, this infrastructure, and, and really for uh, this integral part of our community that we deserve right now. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we're just going to take a... a a break for Judy to come up and speak. She had asked to speak, so we'll sort of intermingle council members among the audience. Thank you. Thanks very much. The question I'm getting, because I've been on council since 1995, the question I'm getting is, how could you leave this goal for so long? And I want to tell you that every year we put capital funding into the uh, pool, uh, in 2016, we were very short of, of funding, and we took out a debenture of $340,000 to do work on the pool. And I don't think any councillor, old or new, or I should say former terms or, or new terms, uh, obviously I'm the old one, um, I don't think any of us were at all aware of how serious the situation was at the pool until we saw the recent studies. And certainly, I, as well as I believe all council, want to get a pool up and running just as soon as possible. We realize what a valuable asset it is to the community. And there were a number of, of reasons why we didn't know how serious the uh, situation was. As most of you know, I retired from Department of Labor 10 years ago. My job hasn't been filled. Right after I left Department of Labor, the Workplace Safety and Health Officer for the province retired. His job wasn't filled. So there's many reasons why uh, we find ourselves in this situation. But I can tell you we are committed to, to have a pool as soon as possible. Thank you very much. My name is Larry McCauley. Uh, I've been a resident of Thompson for 39 years now, <clears throat> and I too recognize the value of the pool. But I want my comments I'm going to restrict to uh, just a couple of things. One, uh, we can't turn back the clock, and I don't think it serves any purpose uh, for finger pointing or saying what went wrong. Fact is, we are here. Something very, something did go very wrong, but now we have to move forward. And I'm a believer in the, in the KISS principle, keep it simple. And we need to move forward, and we need to move forward quickly, because there are a lot of people that do need a new pool. And I'm, I'm going to ask a question here. What would the engineering study cost if we just scrapped the whole idea of refurbishing the old pool? Let's just move forward with a new pool. Let's get a state-of-the-art facility Let's get input from the community, get some great ideas, bring everything up to code. Yes, it's going to cost money, but we have to make that commitment. How we get that money, if we can get the grants, great. If we have to raise taxes, I'm not in favor of raising taxes any more than anybody else. But in this case, maybe it's something that we really seriously need to look at. Because I'd like to see that shovel in the ground earlier than nine months. I'd like to see a study done as quickly as possible and get rid of the notion that we're going to refurbish the old pool. And the sooner we do it, the better off we are. Well, he, he actually stole my thunder because uh, my name is Sandra Ross Hitch. Um, I just wanted to say you, we can't do the we coulda, shoulda, you know, thing. Put the past in the past. Uh, whatever works quickly. And I know that this community is an amazing community. We can do anything that we set our minds to, and we can do it quickly and be the bell of the ball. So that's what I'm saying, is whatever we can do, Let's do it quickly. 
let's get a plan in place and we can do it. And it is, if it is that uh, we are not going to go back to the old facility and we're going to do a new facility, uh, which I think is a good thing, uh, there is some, th some money that um, I'm speaking from the Winter Games that we put into that facility just last year and hopefully we can take some of that, um, we, we put in new lockers, I'm hoping that they can be salvaged if we are not going to uh, go back to that facility and put it into the new facility and hopefully um, our, our books will be closed in a few months and maybe there's some good news for the city coming from us too. So that's all I have to say. Uh, Brian McCusker. Uh, I've swam over 11,000 kilometers in the pool. Um, the pool has been a pretty significant entity in my life. Um, I'm retired here. Thompson has not done a good job keeping uh, retired people here. We have a poor arena. Um, we can't see the ice surface for over half the seats in the arena. I go to the PAW, I see what they've done with their track and their facility. Uh, we don't have it. I would just like to think that whatever we do, that we're going to do a first class job at it, that we're not going to have second rate pool like we do in arena, that we are going to take into consideration all the things that Anthony had uh, up there. We have, as I say, done a real poor job taking care of old people in Thompson. There are pools around that you can take wheelchairs into the pool, special designed pools. They have ramps. The water, Anthony, you know, I think it was very astute of him to say that they have different parts of the pool. And you can bring wheelchairs in there and you can get people in there. I swim at 1130. I've been doing it for nearly 30 years, I guess. You know, I think right now there was only two of us that were only that were over 65. And we have a lot of people in town and we're just not getting those people into the pool. And whatever the direction is, I think that we have to try to do something to encourage people to stay in Thompson and to give them purpose, to give them purpose to get out of the house every day, out of their apartments, wherever they live. And I think that generally people who make the decisions about facilities are young and they don't understand it. They don't have the perspective that older people have in terms of health and, and, and exercise and, and all of those things that come along with it. So I would certainly encourage the people who are going to be involved in this process uh, you know, to, to keep in mind the aging population in Thompson because as far as I'm concerned, we've done a horrible job. We get people coming up to, to sell, come to Bertle retirement and they list all the things that they have for old people and then we get Swan River you know and it's embarrassing you know because what do we have for old people in Thompson to do you know really we have a walking track that you can't wear shorts in the winter and it's dull and it's poor lighting and it's a you know it, it's not a good facility but everybody hides behind the facade that it is but really it's not because we're really myopic we don't look at what other people have and it's really unfortunate that we just sell ourselves short and, and as a senior person, you know, I'm really offended by that, that we don't have, you know, better facilities uh, for people. And like Larry says, you know, never mind wasting money and time. Let's just get a pool, you know, and, and let's just get on with it. Stop making excuses. Thank you. My name is Pauline, and uh, I've been an early morning swimmer, a 6 a.m. swimmer for probably 25 or 30 years. Actually, 30 years ago, there wasn't a 6 a.m. swim, but um, last February, the 6 a.m. swim was cut because you didn't have the money to pay for it. So I guess I'm questioning, um, there's no point having a pool if you can't fund it, and you can't keep it open for swimmers, whether you're a 6 a.m. swimmer because a lot of us work, and we can't swim at noon, we can't swim at 2.30 in the afternoon, 
And by 6.30 at night, either we're having supper or we're getting kids to events or there's lots of things. So if you cannot find the funds to support a 6 a.m. swim, then I really question how we're going to find the funds to build a new pool. Serena Peranin, AKA according to the Thompson Citizen, avid swimmer. Um, and so some of you will have already read my piece. I'm gonna try not to cry because this breaks, this breaks my heart. Um, like some of the other people here, I swim regularly. As um, the one lady mentioned for mental health, I have a stressful job. You have taken away the only thing that brought me peace and literally um, this is depressing. It's now complicated by the fact that my main a method of dealing with things is taken away. And if there were problems in 2009 that the TRCC has built, um, I admit I am angry because it seems like when it's hockey, this town will come up with the money. When it is swimming, which is much more accessible to the senior people, and my mother is a swimmer, the only thing that's keeping her alive in many ways is that she swims. Um, it's accessible, it has so many more benefits, and it's been left and neglected. And some of you councils council members may remember that sometime before the Winter Games, I was in front of you saying, we're spending this money on a new, new pool heater, but when are you gonna fix the hole in the women's ceiling? Because that's been there for almost, at that time, three years. And you had a lifeguard do the caulking job in the um, ch women's change room. And as much as I love the lifeguards, I don't necessarily think they should be doing a caulking job. So I'm desperately hopeful that in this community where people seem to get angry about having to pay for water, that this town will still come up with the money for a pool. Because as others have said, I think it's incredibly important. And as um, Steve Ashton said, not having a community pool, I think, absolutely shows this town has in many ways just given up. Um, the Paw has a pool, Flin Flon has a pool. Their pools were not as good as ours, although clearly they might have been safer and uh, more structurally sound. But I've swam in them. I've swam in 14 public pools, I think, I think within the last six years of my life. Um, the electrical fire that was mentioned, was that the fire that was when we had people in there fixing the sauna? Anybody answer? That I'm not sure. All I, from the records, I'm new enough that, went through the records and I saw that there was a fire, I believe, in early 2017. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the other fire. Um, and I, I guess that comes back to this, I don't know that I'm gonna be able to stay in town long enough to see a pool built because I, I can't function without a pool. When I moved to Thompson nine years ago, one of the first things I was Googling was, does Thompson have a pool? Um, and it was 25 meters, so it was great. Um, but if, with all due respect, this city clearly let this pool get so neglected, I think there is still some um, benefit to figuring out how it got this bad so we don't wind up doing it again. And I, I'm, <laughs> with the utmost respect to Council Member Valentino, I don't know how often you've been at the pool or used the pool, um, and I know you were obviously part of the council that somehow this managed to get by, um, but I'm going to hope that there are more people on this, on this committee who do use the pool, who see it as incredibly important, um, a piece of my heart has been ripped out. And so I wish I could be um, more organized in my thoughts, but this, com this community needs a pool for the old people, for the young people, for the stressed out people. Um, and also, if we want to attract new people to this community, we have to show that we're making some kind of progress, that we're not letting ourselves go, and that there is something for people of all ages, health, and financial backgrounds. Um, to access for recreation. Uh, Jeff 
fountain is going to say a few words. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, I probably many, more than many people, I uh, had some extreme sadness with respect to closure of the pool because like many of the people who spoke quite passionately about the pool, I've spent most of my life in it in the time that I was here. I was a competitive swimmer. I did martial arts upstairs. Um, I worked as a lifeguard for a number of years and now with my kids, I'm watching them do TNT and I'm still using the pool to keep active and and have time with my children. Um, so I want to um, just express that I'm on that committee. It's important to me, it's a priority for me that we get something that works um, and that whatever that is, that it's something that we can afford to maintain, that makes sense in terms of programming and that it makes sense in terms of getting people into it and using it. Um, so thank you very much for, for expressing your concern about that. I hope to do a good job for you, and uh, I hope to do a good job for my kids who are very much looking to get back in the pool themselves. Thank you. I didn't realize until just recently, oh sorry, by the way, my name is Donna Wilson, um, how important swimming is to people. I'm not a swimmer myself, but my heart goes out to people like Vanessa and Serena that I know you know, for Vanessa, I know her personally, and it has helped save her life. And we do need a pool for seniors and people like Vanessa. So um, please make sure we get the pool back. Um, I just wanted to mention that my brother is a paraplegic. He was in a, an accident a couple of years ago, and swimming is saving his life. Every day he swims. He's paralyzed from his chest down but he swims with his arms and his legs just sink and he drags them. And he sends me a picture every day of his laps. And on Facebook today, I saw he put this, he put my swim today, just arms, no legs. I rock, 800 meters, 32 laps, 102 minutes, 1,275 calories. Swimming is important. My name is Samantha Long, and I am an aquatic fitness leader here in Thompson. I'm probably going to get a little emotional, so just bear with me, and I don't like speaking in front of people, but the pool is for swimmers, for non-swimmers, athletics, seniors, people who have injuries, people who have back pain, people who are obese, pre- and postnatal women, people who have arthritic or other situations where mobility is restricted. My ultimate goal as a fitness leader and has been in Thompson is to develop the whole person, spiritually, mentally, and physically. Teaching aquatic fitness has helped me reach so many people with different abilities who have come from all walks of life. I've te been teaching aquatic fitness for more than half of my fitness career. I kind of find it a little insulting when it says you talk to the people who use this facility. I've been renting the facility for as long as I've been teaching and no one has asked about my participants, what they're gonna be doing now. My heart goes out to those TNT kids because they put their friggin' hearts into their sport and now they need to wait. I look forward to the new pool, and but what are we gonna do in the meantime? the people who are waiting for surgeries, the people who have had surgeries, what are they gonna do now? These are the main people that come to my fitness classes. What I've experienced teaching is like none other that I have taught aquatic fitness. I don't like the water, I actually have a fear of water, but I understand the importance of it. It has provided a safe environment for those uncomfortable to come to my other land fitness classes. Uh, the water makes them feel free, and there's nothing that I can replace with that. There's no other fitness class that I can help them with. I feel like I have let my people down. It is a low-impact people for, for people to move. People in the water, it's calming, it's relaxing, 
It's a refreshing and it's a huge stress reliever. It creates, uh, sorry, benefits of the aquatic environment is resistance that creates an appropriate overload. Buoyancy enhances flexibility and decreases impact. Muscle assisted by gravity and, and is resistant by, resisted by buoyancy. The stabilizers are constantly being used. Increased body awareness, preventing bone loss. The only thing that I've seen in the past is it the, it's very limited to the people for accessibility for especially people with mobility issues. So the new pool coming forward, I really hope that it's totally up to code and it's accessible for people to come in with those limited mobilities. But I guess my biggest question is how can we serve our people now while we wait? What can be done? We have two empty pools in the city. Is there anything that can be done to be using them to help our people now while we wait? Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, I thought maybe I was the only one here scared of water. Uh, I've always had a fear of water. I was actually in that pool twice. I signed up with my son for uh, mum and tots. The first day went really great. The second day they said, okay, mum, let's put our head under water. I'm out of here. I'm sorry. So I actually had to go come out of that class. We didn't finish it, and I got my sister to do finished classes with them. But that's how important this pool is. All seven of my children learned how to swim there. Fifteen plus of my grandchildren learned how to swim. I've had grandchildren in the TNT club. My daughter was one of the originals back when it started 40 years ago. The pool is a part of Thompson, and we can't forget it. And I know our staff is working to put things in the interim. I'm sure if you get a hold of them at the... Uh, rec center, uh, they'll go uh, moving forward uh, when Kathy forms our committees and that. It's good, we have an ad hoc committee, but I foresee that being almost like a winter games committee. There'll be a central committee, then there'll be fingers out there doing all kinds of things in the community to get this pool back up and running. been swimming in, the, in that pool for 30 years. My kids have gone through it and I've taken lots of other people and encouraged. I've had three replacements. I'm on my third one and because the pool is closed it's taking me a long time to get mobile again. I've encouraged people to go to the swimming pool at all times. And it was a big part of my life. And I feel, as Serena said in the paper, that I've had a death. And that really has happened. My mental health has began to deteriorate because I don't have the pool to go to. My daughter said to me, Mom, what are you going to do? There's no pool. You're going to have to leave. And yes, I am going to have to leave unless you people get your act together and get a pool here and get something going as quickly as possible. I don't think we need another study to decide whether you want a new pool or refurbish the old one. You need to get going and do something now. Hi, my name is Robin Foley. First off, I wanted to thank all of you, the city councillors, uh, city manager, Mr. McGinnis. Um, not that it's a happy presentation, but it was well needed and well explained. I am not a political person at all. I leave that to my counterparts. Um, but it gave me a better perspective of what happened, potentially why it happened, how it happened, and I do appreciate that communication. So I wanted to start by saying thank you. Um, there was mention by Mr. McGinnis about moving away from the pool itself, changing some of the, well, lack of better wording, the way you do things. You were talking about centralizing engineering or maintenance, I should say, so on. 
from a citizen point of view, it seems like a serious breakdown of communication through layers. Whether council knew, at what point did they know, who knew, who made the decisions, and this is going through like decades. So my question, if it can be answered, is one, how did the communication system work before? And then moving forward, how is it gonna change to hopefully be more efficient or to prevent this from happening? Thank you. Um, I could address that. Um, one of my goals, as well as I believe my understanding of council's goals is to be transparent, not to sugarcoat things. That's why it was a very black and white presentation was to lay out as many facts as we could. The facts that we don't know will tell you we don't know, we're working on them. It was just to bring out as much information as possible so that there's a clear picture of what's happened. Hi, my name is Tara Warren. Um, I wasn't here for the big, whole presentation, but I do want to thank council, Mayor and Council for coming together tonight to listen to the community. Um, I'm a phys ed teacher here, and one of the most important things that uh, we offer at our school for some of our classes is swimming lessons and that is and not just swimming we use it for kayaking we use it for a number a uh, number of things so i th agree with larry and uh, i have listened to dorothy because she has told me to get to the pool and take my kid there and get them swimming and i agree with larry that you know we need to move forward uh, no more finger pointing and let's just get something going and for me uh, a a uh, place that would be very beneficial to the programming at Artie Parker, and I think for a lot of schools that can access, because I think part of the problem is accessibility for our schools. We don't have school buses. We can't get our kids to those programs. We've had, I went to school here, and I went swimming in grades three and four. We can't get our kids to the pool because they're of, of uh, transportation. So I think having it a little bit more localized so kids can walk to the pool. We can use the pool as part of our program at Artie Parker. And, and work together with the pool staff, which we have in the past, to um, bring these programs to our kids and making sure that they are getting out and swimming. We are surrounded by water. I'm a cabin owner. I want my child to know how to swim. So um, I'd be one of the first people, I think, to say up here, I would like to be on the committee that is uh, moving forward with hopefully a new pool and a new location. And I will work hard to uh, help uh, the community of Thompson come with, up with a new pool and I have got lots of people that already said yes I want to help with the pool they want to stay here they want to bring their families up here and they want their kids to know how to swim so like I said I'm uh, Kathy I will be on that committee if, uh, helping out with any way I can hello my name is uh, Glenn Ringrose um, I really didn't know what I wanted to say uh, when I came here. I knew I needed to say something. Um, after watching the presentation, I appreciate the transparency of what you presented tonight. You even spoke to the fact that you were informed to stay at a high level perspective with the um, past inspections of the pool, which, you know, hopefully going forward, you, you, you do have, I always say, uh, with safety, you have control to protect yourself and others. And if you don't have any safety, you have no control to protect anybody. And um, I, I speak here not for every TNT swim, swimmer, uh, but I know my story is similar to the young fellow right next to me here and several other parents that I know are here, Regan and others that have children in the TNT program. Some are at advanced levels, and some are working towards scholarships at universities, uh, you know, with swimming. It really is a vehicle for a lot of kids to gain confidence, uh, safety. You know, as you said, drowning is an epidemic in, in the north, and uh, second uh, leading cause of death to choking for adolescents. And uh, I've lost uh, nieces and nephews in both circumstances, so I take it pretty seriously. The effects that this pool has on my family, um, I, I, <laughs> I see a lot of people struggling with their mental health right now. Professionals, trained professionals, highly educated people. Um, 
I, I like to think of myself as highly educated. It's my profession. And I honestly can sit here today and say to everybody that I'm struggling a little bit too, okay? This pool meant the world to me more than I ever realized with my little girl. So my story is similar to a lot of other parents. I got Sadie, my little girl, into swimming when she was four months old. I had a, we had a hot tub at home and we lowered the temperature, but at the age of four months, she learned how to swim and she just loves the water like I've never seen anybody love it. So I put her into the swimming lessons and, and everything else at the pool and it was the point of it was not to make an Olympic champion, it was for life skills. It was for her to get exercise, healthy exercise, and uh, develop confidence. And in a, it, this is her second year on the TNT swim team. She just turned eight years old. And in that time frame, she's 13 seconds off of provincial time to qualify to be in the provincials. That's pretty special to me. She doesn't really understand it. She just loves to swim. I've, I've put her in other sports, Taekwondo, uh, skating, you know, uh, um, I tried dancing. Dad, I wanna swim. I love swimming. She doesn't wanna do the other sports. She wants to swim. What the hell am I supposed to do with a seven-year-old girl? She just turned eight. What am I supposed to do? I'm stuck. I move? What do we do? And she's, again, that's my daughter. There's lots of other kids with similar stories. I'm, I'm at every practice. I've taken her to every meet in the province that I can uh, that's available. And we need to do something. So looking forward, I would like to join the committee. I have a lot of background in sports athletics and things like that. Myself, I know the value of swimming for rehab. I had my knee reconstructed, and that's actually, the, other than swimming lessons, that's when I really got into swimming in Winnipeg. But um, I think I'd like to know, is there something, because there are a lot of people here that have special needs. There's older people. There's people that haven't got the mobility. Uh, there's spe I, on the way in here, I met a parent of a child who's 14 years old who's forced to, and I don't want to speak for you, wherever you are. <laughs> okay. But it, it, I just, just to touch on it, it I'm sure she, she can tell you more details to make a better impact, but there's a lot of need for people to have swimming in their lives for so many reasons. I, I, I want to share this with you right now because it, it touches solutions uh, for many of these people. Samantha's situation, uh, elderly, people with accessibility problems. They make fantastic pool systems now that, are, that could be used in the interim as a solution. They're expensive, in, in, but in the grand scheme of things, they're actually, I think, one heck of a tool that could be used for this community. Above ground swimming pool systems with self propulsions. So you can set the speed for whatever the ability of the swimmer is. It could be, you can even get them with treadmills so that you can have people that have accessibility problems, need that exercise. They can actually jog in the water. You can get side by side pool systems where you can have two, pool, two people swimming together. You can even set the, the propulsion systems. At, the, at, the, at variable speeds. So you could have an instructor helping two people at the same time with different abilities, different uh, uh, capabilities for swimming in current. Okay, so I, I really like you to consider that. I'd like to know, is there a budget that could be used towards something like that? And could we allocate the space, give some focus one thing that was mentioned that I gotta agree with, I played over 700 hockey games in my life, minor hockey. There is a lot of focus in the community on hockey and for a reason, because it is a part of our culture. But I think we can spread that, that culture to accommodate what, uh, look how many people are coming up here from all walks of life. <laughs> There's a lot of people, older people, younger people, disabled people, 
And, and these pool systems, you could set them up anywhere and they fit your funding package for, uh, they're, they're starting to make them with solar powered energy. So there's lots of angles associated to accessing those funding uh, that I saw you guys put up on the board. So I'd like to know if there's funding available for that and if there's uh, gonna be consideration for space that could be given for however many units we need to help our community. And those units could be used not only to help the TNT swimmers maintain their fitness and their, their goals, but also help the people that I'm hearing all come up here talk. It, it seems to fit the bill. And those units could be put in a new pool facility in a way that uh, could be utilized for so many people with special needs. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, first I'd like to thank you guys for presenting what you had. It's in great detail. Well, we'll definitely echo what Robin said. Uh, definitely needed to come out. I too, like many in here, have young kids that enjoy swimming and getting their swimming lessons, but I'll keep this short and sweet. One, I'm very upset, very disheartened to hear that we had a report done quite a few years ago with regards to electrical and yet we kept the pool open and had a fire in 2017. and then letting people crawl in confined spaces to try their best to keep this pool going as long as they can. First, let's not forget about those guys that try to keep it going. Let's let them have their qualifications because I still want my kids to continue their swimming lessons even though it may be in a waiting pool in the summertime. My second thing is that, uh, you know, you can only put so much money into something that's broke, right? It's gonna break again. I'm definitely on board with getting something new. And that being said, I wouldn't mind, if needed, to be a part of some kind of committee. I've been a part of a few of them. I think I could have a great input with uh, the youth around the, the community. And uh, with that being said, I pretty much don't need to say any more. Everybody else is taken care of, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's Ian Golding. Uh, just want to offer some outside the box thinking. There, uh, there are companies like Sprung Structures uh, that can have something in place relatively quickly. You could have uh, any, anybody with Google now can can Google Sprung uh, a swimming pool building. Uh, have a look at it. Uh, they they are good for these climates. I've I've done that type of work in the past. Um, and I'm a mechanical engineer, and I've been in the consulting world for a number of years. Would love to be a part of any committee that you have. So my name's Shree Mary. I'm one of a few therapists here in Thompson. And I think we all know how important the pool is to our community, and I have no doubt that either we'll refurbish or build a new one. Uh, my question is, is no matter what, we're going to need money and funding for this. And we've said that some fundraising has started, and I would just like to know what has started and what our plans are to raise the money for the new or refurbished pool. And have we looked at some of the outlying communities to assist us with this pool? Because many of them also come in for school events and stuff like that to use our facilities. So what have we done as a, as a community to look at the funding process of it? Sure, thanks. Um, we've already put in a small grant for the, uh, basically whether we build new or we do refurb, we still need to study because that study develops the engineering plans. So we put in already for a uh, Thompson Community Foundation grant, which is $50,000 towards that if we get it. Um, we've been in discussions with ballet. We put in paperwork with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and we're in, well, waiting to hear when the announcement is with the province. Um, so those are the efforts that we have underway so far. We've um, reached out to our local MP and we received some of the information on possible grants that are available in the province of Manitoba and we started reaching out to those organizations as well to try to get as much fundraising started now as we can. Whether it's for the study and getting the drawings done for the new pool or uh, whether it's for the construction phase of it. Either or, whatever the uh, funding that's available, we're working on actively as we speak. Hi, 
My name is Debbie Bellier. I have a, a well, he's going to be 18 tomorrow. He's a lifeguard. Um, both my boys have gone through TNT. Both of them have gone swimming lessons like lots. Uh, I was supposed to have my knee replaced yesterday, but they moved it for a month ahead. Any chance you could have the pool done in about six weeks? <laughs> Just asking. Um, on that note, uh, I grew up in Nova Scotia. Sorry, not here. God's country over there, not the north. So I grew up in Nova Scotia where we didn't have indoor pools, like not even. Uh, I grew up on farms. And I did all my swim lessons at people's outdoor pools and at the lake. So I would highly recommend that we continue with swim lessons, preferably when there's no snow, though. Uh, we need to have swim lessons at pools, at the lake. We need to train our lifeguards so that they can teach lessons in open water. Uh, my son, unfortunately, was supposed to have his research done shortly before the pool closed, but it was recommended that he um, do it the next one. And now there is no next one. So I really don't want him to lose his research. He graduates this year. I'm hoping he gets a job where he's going. So there are lots of things that we need to do. Uh, I was part of the Winter Games Committee, and let me tell you, when Thompson needs to, we get together, we get the job done. So this is awesome. Do you realize there's more people here for this than there are for drama presentations or music events or concerts? So this is awesome that we have this many people here. What we need is the whole community here to make noise, to make their pockets open, to make noise to the, the province, to the country, to the whoever is going to listen to us to get us some money and some passion so that we can get a pool done as soon as possible. So here's my question, because of course I have to have one. My question is, how many of you guys are gonna go out after this meeting and tell all your friends that they needed to be here and that when we start talking about maybe raising taxes or finding funds in other ways, that we're all gonna talk to our community and say, hey, we need this pool for lots of reasons. And I really want my son to have a job so he can pay for university. Thank you. Hi, sorry, it's too tall. Uh, Dennis Foley, um, just want to say once, repeat, thank you guys for the presentation. The general theme that I've been hearing from a lot of people is, one, being quality of life. And I've said it before in the last four years when I was myself was on council, we could have the best infrastructure in the world, we could have streets paved out of gold, but if we do not have a quality of life or a recreation activity, it's useless. Now the challenge that I, you guys are going to see that I, I'm foreseeing on council is a lot of people, and there's even some people in this room who don't feel we even need a pool to begin with. And that, that's very disheartening to me. And I've seen a lot of it, I've heard of a lot of it from people, but it's going to be up to everybody in this room to challenge them and say, yes, we do need a pool. Is it the most important part of the city of Thompson? No, but it is an important pillar that keeps the city of Thompson together. We've talked about mental health, we've talked about recreation, we've talked about kids. I learned how to swim here. My whole family's learned how to swim here. Um, and it, not only was it a, a great way to do it, but it was cost effective. I grew up, my parents didn't have a vehicle. So we didn't have the option of going to the lake and go swimming at the beach. We went swimming here, why? Because it was walking distance. And we paid two bucks just to get in. So my challenge, and uh, what I, I know that you guys as counselors are gonna face, is that when you hear any objection, or even get a hint of an objection, is to stand your ground. We need a new pool. Don't refurbish it. I understand that studies have to get done because that, like Anthony said, if you're gonna move forward, you gotta move forward and be educated about it. Don't just slap a building up and say, hey, look, this is what we got. Otherwise, we're gonna get situations where one gentleman spoke about how his dissatisfaction towards the actual hockey arena is. So if you hear people that say, well, I don't use a pool, so it doesn't matter to me, stand up to them and say, no, you may not use the pool, but you, somebody in your life, in Thompson, does use the pool. You know, Colleen doesn't swim. She's made that very clear. However, she also pointed out that 99% of her family swims. So that increases their quality of life, which increases her quality of life. And we talk about retirement and people going down south. Well, why are retirees going down south? because they're finding a better quality of life 
somewhere that's not their own hometown. And that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for me living here, it's embarrassing for council, it's embarrassing for all of you. But what's also been said, the great thing about Thompson is that winter games, the arena, when we get told that we can't do something, it happens. We get enough people banding together and that's what we need to do is everybody in this room needs to go out and talk to somebody else and talk to somebody else and find out ways to either do the fundraising, get involved. Don't let it be the typical, we have a meeting, three weeks later no one's talking about it because that's how it is. And I'll, I'll go back a couple years ago, we had a big thing, we had discussions about speed zones in the city of Thompson for months and months and months and months. We had a meeting, a decision was made, nobody talked about it. Let this not be something that we don't talk about again. Keep going for it. And Anthony, uh, I want to really say thank you for um, your idea, with, might not be your idea, but the, the whole idea of centralizing everything. Because I'll be honest with you, I sat on the chair of recreation uh, for the last four years, never saw any of this come up. I've been on a pool tour, I didn't even see the things that you guys saw. So I don't want to go back and start pointing fingers because I don't think that that's going to get anywhere further. But moving forward, let's just keep going. So thank you. Deputy Mayor Valentino and our new ad hoc pool chair is going to speak. So as you know, I'm Deputy Mayor Valentino and uh, I take no offense to the comments about me and my uh, maybe not using Norplex pool. So let me educate you a little bit about that. I have a huge passion for recreation in this city and I'm very, very proud to be able to lead the, the city and our council to build a new pool. I could tell you I was born here in 1970. I was one of the first kids that learned how to swim in the Norplex pool. Not even talking about learning to swim. I know Roy Lima's here, but I learned to water ski in the Norplex pool. They used to move the uh, bulkhead back and they had the dads with a pulley system around the the diving boards and that's how we learned how to water ski in a Norplex pool. So it's not just about learning to swim that we all we all did as kids here. I had three I have three boys, they all took swimming lessons. I have my mom here tonight, she'll be 81 this year and she took them every day. They had a day and uh, they went to the Norplex pool. And then they continue to take swimming lessons all through right up until high school to learn how to swim. They also, I also have a sister who was part of the swimming club, I think probably with Mr. McCusker, because that's how you'll always be to me, and to uh, Bob Mayer, and she swam every day. So I have, I have a lot of use that has been used in my entire family with the Norplex pool since 1970 when I was born here. But it's not about me, it's about this community. And I believe that we are gonna build a new pool. And I challenge this council because I think we all hear loud and clear what exactly the public is wanting. And I don't think we need to waste the time on, on whether we refurbish or not. I think we have heard uh, clearly that um, we should be building a new facility. And I challenge this council now to put it on the agenda to make that decision so we can move forward in a quick and timely manner. A couple other things I, I hear tonight, um, and I can tell you there's been lots of moving parts since this has happened, and, and kudos to uh, our city manager, Anthony McGinnis, and to our administration for, for the work they've done. You have no idea the hours that they've put into all of this and to briefing us, and I appreciate that, and our whole council does. But in some of the moving parts and some of the things we've heard tonight is we've reached out to Sport Manitoba at a, at a high level and at a local level with our Norman region, and we've told them that we need help. And we've told Sport Manitoba that we helped them when we hosted the games here because they needed us and we need them now. So they're willing to help us to provide different courses, programming and training, and they're gonna be creative in what they can do for us as a city. Also in saying that, I hear the concerns with the lifeguards. We have had our pool manager and our rec director who are attending a rec connection seminar or conference and correct me if I'm saying things inappropriate and they have had the opportunity quickly to tour some pools and new facilities that have been built recently within our province. And they've also had support from the Manitoba Life Saving Society on what are we gonna do with these people that are close to being qualified and how do we keep them qualified. So there's been lots of moving parts to lead us up to today to now to hear from you. And one of the things in our, we've only had one pool committee meeting. And the other thing that we talked about briefly was how do we keep communicating with you? How do we keep communicating with the public? 
because we just can't have this open meeting and this is great. So we've talked about, do we do it with a newsletter? Do we do it by Facebook page for the pool? Um, how do we do that? So I'm gonna throw that out to you. How do you want us to communicate with you? Because we have to work together to make this work. We, I hear from you that you wanna be on the committee. That's great. I need you to come and tell us what your name is and how do we contact you? How do you want us to know, tell you when is the committee meeting? So it's easy to say things, but we gotta stand behind what we say. So if we're gonna step up, let's step up. Come and give us the information. We're not gonna have 50 people at a pool committee meeting and we're all gonna sit around and talk for five hours and nothing will get done. But I see the structure, and they said, someone said earlier, similar to how the, the Manitoba Games was set, was we would have a core of people and we would have chairs of ad hoc committees. We will need someone to be an ad hoc committee, say for, um, our lifeguards and our workers so that we're constantly knowing that they are being looked after in the training and where are we at with some programming and what are they doing within the community to the youth and, and the life saving society. We need someone that wants to step up and be a fundraising chair to turn around to people and say if you want this to be a community pool, we got to fundraise, we got to make this happen because we need help money wise also. So somebody's going to have to chair that. So there's going to be lots of moving parts to this committee. It's not just going to be a committee. There will be lots of different subcommittees from it that have to work together to make this happen. So I, I see that, and I know this is being taped, so we ask people to step up. I'm going to throw this to Casper, our communications person at the city, and they hate when I do this, but I'm not very techy at all. But if there's somehow on our, our website we could have a link or where people could somehow, I don't know, communicate with us that they want to be a part of the pool committee or if they can somehow offer suggestions. I don't know, I'm just throwing that out right now, that maybe we can start that on our end, that we can start the communication, uh, open the doors with either Facebook or through our City of Thompson website so we can keep this moving at a, at a quick pace because I think that's something that we've heard tonight. And I know for me, let's get this going, let's build a pool I don't think we need to wait around either. It's only me though, but I do challenge council that we make this decision very quickly on which way we're going so we don't uh, waste time or resources or, or dollars by no means. I think that's all I got. Tammy. Um, I'm the mom of that 14 year old. Um, she has severe cerebral palsy so she's wheelchair bound or she's laying in her bed or on the couch somewhere. Um, we only moved to Thompson four years ago but before we came here she had um, double hip surgery done when she was eight years old. So she doesn't move very much anymore. Um, we always took her in the pool. She always had the water therapy because it's the only time she moves her legs. If she's not in the water, she's she's just straight. She doesn't move. Um, but we've taken her to the pool, and I can have her in there for an hour, and she will kick and splash and do it all. It's really intense. And we had to stop taking her to the pool here because I guess even though it's considered accessible, it's really not accessible for anybody that can't sit up by themselves. Um, I know there's a lift there with the chair. We tried to use it. She almost fell out many times because it's only for people who have that upper body support that can hold themselves up. So I guess my hope is with a new pool that there will be a lot going into it as well for accessibility, for getting wheelchairs and things like that in there, a gradual pool, something to make it easier for kids like mine. And she's not the only one. like. She went to the pool all the time with the ideal site at Westwood. So there's many other kids like her and seniors that could really use the accessibility in a new pool. Everybody. I figure out I must speak because most of my council fellow already spoke, so uh, if I don't speak, I don't want to have a bad impression that I don't agree with the new pool or rebuild. 
I do agree to have a pool. I used to have six pack, you guys don't know. And because of, <laughs> ever since the pool don't have a gym, it turned into one. Anyhow, I'm, I'm a logical person. I also a money person. I just want to lay out, I want to be transparent. I want to be everybody aware of. There will be a, a price tag involved. And I also agree sometimes not everything we use money to evaluate the, the, the issues. When everybody spoke about the mental health, the physio, all this, I do recognize all that too. Because I do use the pool, I do so. So being said that, one thing so far I know, to operate the pool is a close to about 800, over $1,000, if I go on, or, or am I right? To keep that pool, so to moving forward for the new pool, I don't know what the, what's that going to be look like. So we have to face reality as well. That's one part of the, uh, the, the, the thing that I need to address. Another thing I also heard about people who couldn't move because there's no pool. So right now we have no pool. That's a reality. So to build a new pool, that's a challenge. It's not going to be happen tomorrow. We got to we gotta find money. And how much is going to be, I don't know. We need to find out. And it takes time as well. So how long people can wait based on th the condition right now for all the, uh, the person that spoke about their condition, their health condition, how long can they wait? So I heard a lot of comment about new pool. I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing because I try to... I try to solve the short-term short problem. I don't want people to move. To retain you, it sounds like there's no pool, no deal. So I, I, try to, I try to figure out. I'm going to go home and think about what can we do. And I'm also part of the, the ad hoc committee member as well. So I am strongly want to see something really happen. Can we have a short-term fix? I don't know. So those are the, the conversation we must have immediately. So I must say I'm heartbroken. I don't want to be too emotional about that, that part, but I do understand. I've I seen the, the swimming part and all that. I, I do understand all that. So I don't want to drag too long about my, 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 my statement. So I just got to go back to the management and if anything want to add, I think I'm, I'm done with what I need to say. else would like to speak? Okay, with that being said, the turnout here tonight, thank you very much. Basically, it may sound like we don't have a lot of ideas to hand you. This was the idea of transparency. Like Kathy said, there's lots of work going on behind the scenes, but we really thought it was important to hear you first before we started making a lot of plans, doing a lot of things, then coming to you and saying, oh, what would you like? Ooh, but we've already done that. So this was the idea of this meeting. So please go out and spread the word. Get people to phone us, call us. Uh, Casper's going to, you know, he's just been commissioned to set up something for communication. Uh, Carol and Sonia are at the rec center. Hark Majid, I'd like to thank him for you know, all the work he's done to bring us to this stage, to make this presentation to you tonight. And foremost, I'd like to thank Anthony for the openness, uh, the ease with which we work with him, with that he works with us, all my fellow councillors. When we got that report that Tuesday night in the council, my grandchildren were coming Friday and all I could think of, I can't let them go there. So I can't let anybody else go there. So and within a very short time, everybody was on board because our staff was very important. We were jeopardizing them, and we were jeopardizing you. So with that being said, I'll let Anthony say the last word, and thank you for coming. 
So thank you. Um, I guess I'll just echo what everyone else has said. This is a beginning. It's not uh, the end. Um, we just wanted to present as much as we could so you have a clear picture of what's going on. We'll have information up as soon as possible with a website or some way to contact. And um, look forward to hearing from everyone and moving forward on this project. Thank you. And we hope when we announce the transit ad hoc public meeting, as many of you show up or more. Thank you.